How many social justice movements today involve groups of marginalized, disenfranchised people living in one form of exile or another? But despite the exile and the yawning chasm between humanity and the divine world, Ezekiel's God is intimately present among his people, even if only to castigate them for their backsliding and pin the looming disaster on them. It isn't God's fault. It's the people who have broken the covenant. Jewishly speaking, the covenant is a contract, not unlike a marriage contract that can be terminated and set aside if it is not adhered to faithfully. Like the prophet Jeremiah, Ezekiel opines that rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar is the same as rebelling against God. Yet, like Jeremiah, the prophet switches abruptly from condemnation to consolation and brings up the notion of a new heart. Throughout all of this, we shouldn't miss the fact that this God isn't confined to mountain mists like the pagan pantheon of the Near East and Greco-Roman world. He acts in history, declaring above all that history's blows are not random. Things don't just happen by accident, and that alone lent meaning to suffering. It would be an important note of encouragement to every warrior who would suffer for the cause of social justice. Like many social justice warriors, elements of this message are stern. He takes aim at the whole Hebraic concept of schut avot, the merits of the fathers, declaring that if the sons will not be punished for the sins of the fathers, neither will they be rewarded for their merits. At the end of the day, individual responsibility is stressed along with repentance, and that's a uniquely Jewish element. Like Jeremiah, Ezekiel trots out a series of oracles against the nations and announces the coming of another David, clearly a messianic prototype. Naturally, there are multiple issues and debate points regarding the book of Ezekiel. Even rabbinical authorities had their doubts about whether the vision could have come from Ezekiel in Babylon. Since alien soil was considered impure, the prophet must have received his call while still in Jerusalem. Modern scholars question whether someone living hundreds of miles away in a foreign land could have addressed his oracles, mainly to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. How would he even be aware of what was going on in Jerusalem? Either he had paranormal powers or he didn't live in Jerusalem. But Yechezkel Kaufman and Moshe Greenberg 
don't doubt that Ezekiel lived in Babylon. True, the abominations the prophet sees have been cleaned out long ago by Josiah's purge. But that doesn't mean that Ezekiel isn't haunted by memories of what went on long before in the reign of the wicked king Manasseh. Then there is the issue of Ezekiel's vision of a new temple occupying the geographic center of the 12 tribes and presided over by priests from the line of Tzadok. A river of fresh or living water was to flow forth from it and Jerusalem itself will one day be called Yah Shama. God is there. Zot Torat Habayit al Rosh Hahar Kol Gvulo Saviv Saviv Kodesh Kodashim. The rabbis were troubled by the inconsistencies between the description of this temple and the original temple described in the book of Leviticus. Is Ezekiel's temple even kosher? Some critics suggest that the whole temple blueprint may not come from Ezekiel at all, but from some later scribe aligned with his prophetic school. Perhaps the hardest pill for the modern reader to swallow is Ezekiel constantly harping on God's jealousy and the repute of his name. There aren't many warm fuzzies to be found in this book. Ezekiel is so scandalously particular and Israel-centric rather than universal that he's the least admired of the major classical prophets. Should today's social justice advocates shy away from Ezekiel and look to other prophets instead? In Ezekiel's defense, it might be argued that his attitude is part and parcel of the larger war on idolatry. A war that will be won in the world at large only when Israel purges itself from its abominations. In short, ethical monotheism is the seedbed of social justice, and there could be no ethical monotheism as long as its existence is threatened by idolatry. Ezekiel has God say, Vasitivam nekamot gdolot, uvotocha hot chema yadu, kiani hashem, batiti et nakamatibam. There are also issues regarding the nature of Ezekiel's experiences. It's been suggested that he suffered from some physical or psychological disorder, perhaps aphasia, catatonia, epilepsy, or even schizophrenia. In my case, of course, I've been inclined to use cocaine from time to time, but we'd better leave that out of it. In any case, we may indeed be looking at a two-pipe problem. And of course, questions arise regarding the book's authorship. Is it the product of a single author or of a school or a circle owing allegiance to Ezekiel? As with all scholarly questions, there are points to be made on both sides. Whoever wrote it, was closely tied to the temple cult, highly literate, and part of a quasi-esoteric priestly tradition. The author moves thematically between poles of exile and return, divine absence and divine presence, spiritual death and new life. The book itself is organized according to a three-part pattern. Chapters 1 to 24 involve judgment on Israel. Chapters 25 to 32 contain judgments on hostile nations, including diatribes, mock laments, and taunt songs against Israel's enemies. We find oracles against Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt. In the 28th chapter, we find a haunting oracle against the king of Tyre who was once in the Garden of Eden until he was cast down. It's a passage alluded to by John Milton in his classic Paradise Lost. 
Critics often view it as a distinct compilation similar to Isaiah 13 to 23 and Jeremiah 46 to 51. But is it right to atomize texts in such a way? That depends on which side of the scholarly fence you're on. Chapters 33 to 48 are all about salvation for Israel. We find repeated emphasis on a single word, kavod, the technical term in the priestly tradition for the mysterious manifestation of the divine presence, originally connected with the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, the chariot throne Ezekiel envisions is much like the Ark in the wilderness of Sinai, which after all was portable and played host to the divine glory or kavod. One important element of this last section is Ezekiel's famous vision of the dry bones. Haita alai yad Hashem, v'yotzi eni beruach Hashem, v'yanicheni betoch habikah, v'him malea atzamot, v'heavirani alehem saviv saviv, v'hine rabod meod al pnei habikah, v'hine yabeshot meod. אני מביא בכם רוח, וחייתם, ונתתי עליכם גידים, והעליתי עליהם בשר, וקרמתי עליכם אור, ונתתי בכם רוח, וחייתם, וידעתם כי אני השם. It's distinctive in form and content and contains visual symbols of the reversal of the life-death process the issue is whether it represents an early belief in physical resurrection or whether it simply conveys faith in the vivifying power of God to bring forth new life from a dead nation. We also find spliced into the book's final triad, a rambling prophecy about the defeat of the mythical enemy known as Gog and his evil partner, Magog, prompting endless speculation about the identity of this enemy down to the present day. Ko amar Adonai Hashem, hineni elecha Gog, nasi rosh, meshech vetuval, veshovavti, venatati, chachim, bil chayecha, vehotseti otcha, ואת כל חייליך סוסים ופרשים לבושי מכלול כולם קהל רב צינה ומגן תופסי חרבות כולם. The locations mentioned in the bizarre prophecy are actually found in the table of nations in the 10th chapter of Genesis. The entire prophecy appears to be a kind of mosaic of biblical references and motifs. Some argue that these chapters may be dated to long after Ezekiel's day and don't really qualify as prophecy at all, but a completely different literary genre known as apocalyptic. But for every argument, there is a counter argument. Namely, that we find predictions in Jeremiah and elsewhere of a coming foe from the north, making Ezekiel's oracle quite consistent with his day and age. What's the bottom line in all of this? We're certainly dealing with a visionary priest who had an extraordinary wealth of knowledge. The 19th century German critic Julius Wellhausen declared that calling Ezekiel the father of Judaism is oversimplified. 
but he was certainly an important factor in the emergence of the Jewish faith in the early Persian era. If Jeremiah was responsible for saving Judaism and the Jewish people by giving them a reason to persist, even in exile, then Ezekiel represents the next logical extension. In depicting the divine glory, the kavod, as mobile, he laid the groundwork for the many centuries of Jewish wandering and survival to come. And the rest is history.